Welcome to Montrose Middle School in Westmoreland County, Virginia. We're located in a rural area of Virginia with about, we have 300 students at our school and we have one middle school, one high school, and two, and two elementaries. In case you're wondering where we are, we are in the northern neck of Virginia. Now that's different than northern Virginia. We're in a beautiful rural area on the Potomac River. So if you know where the Potomac River goes into the Chesapeake Bay, we're probably about 40 miles from where the Potomac River goes into the Chesapeake Bay. Let me just tell you that we began this journey about a year ago. Our, our project was due on the 31st of March. And, and since that time, we've been working on trying to get it to happen. And lo and behold, it did. In fact, last year or last month, the word of the month was perseverance, wasn't it? And it's taken a lot of perseverance to have this come about, but I think the students appreciate it. I've got with me right now the principal of Montrose Middle, and that's Mrs. Seeger. And uh, things have been pretty busy here. Tell us about what's been going on. Absolutely. We are so excited for this opportunity. Our students have practiced multiple days to prepare for this event. Um, our students each had to participate in an essay contest, and they had the support of their teachers um, in order to formulate some really, really great questions. So we are excited about the, their opportunity to speak with astronaut Bowen on today. Tell us a little bit more about what's going on at Montrose Middle School. You do other things than the International Space Station, I'm sure. Right, right. So in preparation for this event in particular, students were exposed to hand club radio where they were able to communicate with uh, folks and individuals from across the world. In addition, uh, our school has a robust set of programming that is available to each student. So some of our students represent students who are in theater and drama, others who are um, in, in baseball and softball, since that's in full swing right now. We currently have an undefeated basketball team in our in our school and then a, a lot of these students represent some of our our scholars who have um honor roll and principals list designations it's pretty exciting absolutely now you allowed us to do the school club roundup so anybody that's familiar with ham radio knows what the school club roundup is some of them got to talk to some pretty interesting people and i was really interested in the comments that you used to say too that wow they were excited or they didn't get to do it so were they excited about it for certain, I think it's just wonderful that they're getting an opportunity to effectively communicate with folks from around the world um, and to make sure that their voices are heard and they get to ask questions and receive um, valuable information in return. That's good. Well, the stars of this whole thing are the students, Absolutely. for sure. And I must say they've really worked very, very hard writing their questions and practicing them. I'm proud of each and every one of them, for sure. So we're going to introduce them now. I'm going to ask Dr. Perry, wherever he is. Dr. Perry is the superintendent of our schools. And I'm going to introduce our students and let them come up and they can either shake hands with you guys or do a high five or whatever they want to do. So um, just to, to acknowledge them in that way. So Lillian, why don't you come up? Lillian is in the seventh grade. <laughs> and then we have Emily, who's in the seventh grade. And you'll notice they have T-shirts on for um, the ARIS contact as well as a memento. William is in the eighth grade. <laughs> and Jordan is in the eighth grade. We have representatives of all three grades, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Now we have Tyrese, who is in the eighth grade. And Yandel is in the sixth grade. Then we have Levi, who's in the eighth grade. And Yuri is in the sixth grade. Then we have Javen, who is also in the sixth grade. And Caden is a sixth grader. <laughs> and Michaela is a sixth grader.
And Brandon is also a sixth grade. Now, I'm going to put you all on the spot. I know you're, you're nervous, but how many are excited? Thumb, yeah, raise your hand if you're excited. Yeah, okay, good. I think we all are excited. It's an exciting time for us, an exciting thing for you all to be able to do it at, at this at the middle school for sure. Ms. Seeger, thank you so much for allowing us to do it. You kind of got this. You inherited this because you were not the principal when we filed the application. And then all of a sudden I go and I say, hey, Ms. Seeger, we're doing this. And you went, what? <laughs> But she's been very supportive and very helpful. So this is an amazing opportunity for our students. So it's well worth the time and effort. Thank you. We really, we appreciate that for sure. Thank you. All right. So Dr. Perry, let's see what you've had to do with this whole thing is you said yes. Yes, we did say yes, because this is a very exciting opportunity for our students. As you say, we live in the northern neck of Virginia. That's probably an hour away from what we would consider a, a metropolitan area. So this is just big excitement for us. Uh, Ms. Alexander brought it to our school board. Our school board has two engineers and they in particular are absolutely over the moon excited about this opportunity for our students to actually speak to some astronauts. So yes, very excited. Well, and there's so many things now to do with STEM. And while this wouldn't be, quote, a STEM project, it certainly involves that with the ham radio, another way of communication, talking to the space station, all those things. Yes. Ms. Alexander, science is a part of all that we do. And this, this is just an opportunity for older people like me to go all the way back to NASA in Florida. But for our young people, this is what they do all the time, whether they're making robots thinking digitally and to just be able to be on the ground and still contacting someone miles above the earth certainly and that that's just exciting it's exciting for me but they almost take it for granted I, I look at them they're nervous but they're like oh that's just something that we do so but it's very exciting yes lots of science lots of math I think it's it's it's, it's exciting to think about what's going on on the space station right now they're going 18,000 miles an hour. They're 250 miles above the surface of where we are. And just to think about, what do you think the astronauts do it up there right now as we're sitting here waiting to come in view? I can't wait to hear the questions because as our students were asking about eating and sleep and all these things, I couldn't help but think about Marvel, Marvel Universe, Guardians of the Galaxy. So these are our true life guardians of the galaxy. And so we can't wait to hear the information that they share with our students. And this will be truthful information and not some of the fanciful thing that they see on television. So it's sure. exciting. Well, Dr. Perry, you and I grew up in the age of space. Yes. And we got to see a lot of the exciting things that happened in space. And it seems like our country is moving back in that direction. You think this is going to help prepare them? I think it will. When we consider the initiatives that our federal government, you know, we now have, I forgot the exact name, but we're looking at a military branch in space. We are looking at individuals sending up rockets to out into space. This is going to, this is more of a, a regular conversation for our children. And I'm looking probably forward to some of them actually joining, whether it's Elon Musk or whoever, they'll be working with them. In fact, I even think about the fact that when, in my day, we would go outside and try to see them up, you know, outside and try to see a stream going in the sky. But our students are sitting in an air-conditioned room watching a big screen and they can actually see the astronauts. And we couldn't do that when we were young. So, yes, this is an exciting time for our young people. Yeah. And you've been involved in education, and I'm not going to ask you how long. <laughs> we'll put you on the spot. But I know you've been involved in education for a long time. Have you ever been involved in anything like this in any of the divisions where you've been? Wow. Ms. Alexander, no. The short answer is no. Just no. We've been involved in some engineering activities where we have worked with Walt Disney to correct problems 
Uh, I think it was Disney where they would correct the problem and students, if they won, they could get a job. But this is much, much larger than that. We never had direct contact with our space pioneers, with our astronauts as they would orbit. This is just super huge, so much so that, again, we have board members who are taking time off of their job to make sure they can hear and see what's going on. I spoke to some of my colleagues in other parts of Virginia and, and in North Carolina, and they're like, you're doing what? <laughs> because this is exciting. So, no, never been involved in anything like this. And I think I think it can make a, a difference to how we feel about our, 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 our division. And, you know, if we can do this, what else can Westmoreland do? I agree again. When I consider the fact that we have astronauts way up there and all eyes are on them, but their eyes are going to be on us. Mm -hmm. That is just truly exciting to me that here in little Westmoreland County, rural Westmoreland County, all across the country and the world, people at least are going to know the name. And I can see them Googling, trying to find out who we are. Googling to see which students ask what question. It is just a very exciting time. Yeah. Very exciting time. When when I first moved to Virginia, a friend of mine came down and she said, you live at the end of the world. <laughs> but it's yeah. a beautiful end of the world and it's a great end of the world. And um, I know sometimes our, our students want to leave Westmoreland as soon as they get out of high school and they don't want to come back here. But this kind of gives you the opportunity of looking at other possibilities yes. and, and even coming back and being a teacher in Westmoreland and showing how important that can be and how they can impact it. Yes. In fact, you know, it's amazing when they're young, they want to leave. And then when they go a little bit older, realize as Dorothy said in The Wizard of Oz, there really is no place like home. So we're excited when our students do leave and get skills, but probably even more excited when they do come back. But when while they are here, they can realize the opportunities that they have. That's probably the most exciting of all. And I do hope that as our students are hearing their questions answered, as they are considering just how dramatic and huge this is, that they realize that great things do happen in Westmoreland County. In fact, one of the things we've always wanted to do, we believe that we influence anyhow this corner of Virginia, but we're hoping that even in Richmond, they realize that, yeah, we're here. And as the who said to Horton, we're here and doing great things. Well, and I think I think sometimes we think we can't do things. I think, oh, yeah, we're in Westmoreland, so what do we have to say or what can we do? And we don't believe in ourselves. And it's wonderful when we have these words of the month like perseverance and respect and, and all these because it shows, yeah, we can do it. It's a matter sometimes of a of a just a mindset change of believing that we can do it. Absolutely. I'm still convinced that. The only limits that we truly have are the ones that we put on ourselves. And just as we, again, we're taking metal, which is supposed to fall to the ground, gravity is supposed to hold, just like we can defy gravity and we can go out in space. I'm believing that our children's realizations and their imagination, they'll realize that there are no limits to what they can do, that they can be astronauts. They can make the, they can actually make the rocket. You know, the, your science and knowledge you're getting now, there's just no limit to what they can do. And they don't have to leave home to do it. They actually, with all the remote learning and things we dealt with lately, they can work from home. They can learn it here. So, yes, no limitation, just what we put on ourselves. And I think sometimes we think about spaces. Oh, it's the astronauts up there. But the videos will show us in a little bit that there are a ton of people that make that happen. It's not just the astronaut, but all these people in a room doing a different thing for those rockets and for the astronauts. And probably you've seen some of the movies where it shows what it's like at Mission Control, but there's just a ton of people. So if you're interested in computers or interested in anything else, it's, it's a great place to, to look. Absolutely. In fact, our young people, they're looking, they're seeing 
um, the control on the screen. But I also hope they're looking even at uh, Mr. Caskey to our left. They are working the uh, uh, keyboards and everything to make sure that connections stay clear. There are so many jobs connected to just getting a, just getting a rocket to the pad, let alone getting it up. And hopefully they'll talk about the fact that even when the rocket is in space, it is still a lot of the controls are still being monitored and taken care of here on Earth. So lots of things, lots of jobs to be had. Young people, we need you to be engaged. We need you to be employed. Sky's the limit. Don't limit yourself. Yeah, I think, and I think sometimes we just get discouraged and think, oh, what's the use? I can't do it. No, yeah, that's not right. I mean, it used to be that it was, you know, this country gave the, yeah, we can do it. It's mom, right. apple pie, and the flag. We can do it. And just with this event here at the middle school, talking you into it, talking the singer <laughs> into it, you know, that's that's a, a huge thing. It's It's been a lot of fun. And uh, I told Miss Seeger she'll probably be glad, glad when this is over with. She won't see me anymore for a while. But, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, been a, it's been a good thing. And I think it's a good thing to show that the, uh, them that, that we can do it. Okay, well, our time is down up. We do not have much more time. We're going to turn it over to Bob, our moderator. So thank you, thank you all very thank much. You. Thank and you. thank you very much for letting us do this. Over. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind everyone that this contract will, or contact, excuse me, will be recorded. As well as Carol mentioned, it's being uh, live streamed, and folks uh, pretty much around the world are interested in this and watching it. Some many of them on YouTube. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Bob McCown. My uh, ham radio call sign is N3IYI. I'm your Harris moderator today for IFS Contact with Montross Middle School in Montross, Virginia. With the help of amateur radio volunteers and the crew on the IFS, we soon hope to establish radio contact with the International Space Station as it flies more than 250 miles above Earth over us here in Greenbelt, Maryland, and pretty much over you as well in Montross. This is all accomplished through ARIS, Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. The ISS is currently approaching the west coast of the United States. It's uh, not quite over Alaska yet. And it's traveling along at about 18,000 miles an hour. And what that means is we'll have access to it uh, for a little over 10 minutes as it passes over us here in Greenbelt. Contact for today will be performed using the ARIS Telebridge Network, of which the three of us here are uh, proud to be volunteer members and supporters. This is a worldwide network of amateur radio ground stations that enables students to contact the ISS the way we're going to do today. This has been done over a thousand times so far, uh, over many years, and uh, many, many students have had the opportunity that you'll have shortly. And we're very, very pleased to uh, give you this opportunity. ARIS is an international consortium of volunteers from several nations that assist to develop and operate the amateur radio equipment, not only on board the ISS, but at the uh, ground stations, such as the one we're sitting at. Some of the agencies internationally that support ARIS are the American Radio Relay League in the United States, the Worldwide AMSAT Amateur Radio Satellite Corporation, Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, Japanese Space Agency, the Russian Space Agency, and of course NASA. That's radio ground station that we'll be using today to establish direct radio contact is Aeris Ground Station K6BUE, and we are here at K6BUE located in Greenbelt, Maryland. We're hosted at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, but we are, uh, again, a station and the volunteers are with here. The station today will be operated by Melissa Four, assisted by Ken McCoy. Melissa, please go ahead and say hi, and Ken, go ahead. Thanks for helping us out. Hi, you Hello. Yes, you 
guys all squared away and uh, ready for the contact to give you a better idea of what's going to happen. We're going to ask uh, the school there to run a video presentation, which was produced by the American Radio Relay League. It shows students what to expect during our upcoming contact with the ISS from a student perspective. Chris, uh, there at school, please go ahead and roll the first thing. Hi, my name is Ruth. And my name is Chris. You must be pretty excited to talk directly with astronauts on the International Space Station today. While we're waiting for the space station to come over your portion of the sky, let's talk a little bit about how it's going to happen. Of course, Mission Control is in contact with astronauts all the time using a big radio with lots of fancy equipment. However, we're going to be using something very different today. We are going to use ham or amateur radio to talk directly to the International Space Station. When most people hear the word radio, they think of a music radio station. But it's so much more than that. Radio actually refers to the unseen energy that transmits all sorts of signals using electromagnetic waves. At first, people learn how to send signals like Morse code. And then they discover that you can send so much more, like data, computer signals, and even TV. Maybe you don't realize it, but you use radio every day. Maybe you watched the TV this morning, or you texted your friends, or maybe even you check social media like Twitter or Instagram. Let's travel back to space for a minute. Since the beginning of the space age, humans have sent many spacecraft out into the universe. These range from the Hubble Space Telescope orbiting the Earth daily, and the Curiosity rover exploring Mars. We've even sent a long-distance messenger the Voyager 1, who has traveled outside of our solar system. Whether it's capturing a great picture of a far-off galaxy or conducting experiments on the space station, radio has to do with all of these. And today, you're going to be using ham radio. Now you might be wondering, what exactly is ham radio? Amateur or ham radio is a service and a hobby where operators can talk to people around the neighborhoods, their cities, their country, and even around the world. Amateur radio operators require a radio license from the government. They're not that hard to get. I have one. My call sign is KM4LAO. And mine is KD8YVJ. Our call signs are a way of identifying who we are to other operators. This lets everyone know that we have the proper license to using the radios. As amateur radio operators, or hands as we are often called, we can talk with others about basically whatever we want often science or some new radio gadget that we are interested in. Let's focus back to the space station and your contact today. Many of the astronauts and cosmonauts aboard the space station are licensed ham radio operators. That's why your operators today can contact us. The people here, as well as the astronauts, are licensed to talk to each other, and you are allowed to talk over to their radio. For our conversation today, we'll need an amateur radio station on the ground either in this location or somewhere else around the world. We'll also need a radio in the space station. Anyone SS, anyone SS. You can hear the calls come. This is November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra, the International Space Station, over. On the space station, the radio transceiver is connected to an amateur radio antenna mounted on the outside. One of these antennas will be used today during our contact. For our side of the contact, we need a good-sized antenna, a signal amplifier, something to make our signal stronger, and a rotator for turning our antenna. We have to keep our antenna pointed right at the International Space Station. And remember, it's moving across the sky and fast. To aim the antenna properly, we need to track the path of the space station exactly. NASA uses complex systems to track the path of the space station and other orbiting objects. The satellite tracking program we are using works out a complicated set of mathematics to provide the orbital location of the space station moment by moment as it moves through space. This information is sent to the computer that controls the antenna rotator, which moves the antenna to follow the space station. Maybe some of you have seen or worked with robotics. That's pretty cool stuff. And just like you can program a robot where to go, what to do, and how to get there, 
You can also program a computer to tell an antenna how to track the space station across the sky. You know, it took a lot of planning to get this contact. Several weeks ago, the ARIS operations team had to figure out when the space station's orbit would pass over this location. Then, they had to talk with the planners at NASA's Johnson Space Center. The crew's time is pretty full, so they were able to find a time that could work for the crew members' schedules. Once they found times that would work both in space and here on the ground, the host organized this contact. And in just a few minutes, you'll be hearing and talking to the astronauts. Well, it's almost time for your contact. It will be exciting, so good luck with it! Hey, that's a uh, video from the student's perspective. Now we're going to take a look at uh, another little video that shows astronaut uh, Tim Peek, who was a British as a uh, astronaut from the UK, and how uh, he viewed doing air contact from the ISS perspective. Chris, go ahead and roll the video. Second video. Hi everyone, I'm Tim Peake and welcome aboard the International Space Station where we're orbiting Earth 16 times every day. One of the most rewarding activities that some astronauts undertake on orbit is to talk to schools using the space station's ham radio. Now these are events that are planned by ARIS which is a worldwide group of amateur radio volunteers who are dedicated to introducing young people and students to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Now this is the equipment here in the Columbus Laboratory which consists of a handheld radio, a headset and we also have a ham video unit. Now as the International Space Station orbits above your location a radio link is established between the ISS and your school. Now, because we're traveling at nearly 18,000 miles per hour, which is an incredible 25 times the speed of sound, we usually get about nine or 10 minutes of good radio contact before losing the signal. So about five minutes before the scheduled start time of the contact, I come into the Columbus Laboratory and configure the radio so that I'm on the correct channel. And sometimes I'll set up the ham video too. Just before the predicted time, I begin to start calling the school using the standard amateur radio calling techniques. For example, if the call sign of your school was GB4 Fun, I would say Golf Bravo 4, Foxtrot Uniform November. This is Golf Bravo 1, Sierra Sierra, listening and standing by. Now at your school, the radio operator will be listening for my call, but may also transmit and try to call me as well. You'll probably have a much more powerful transmitter on the ground than we have up here on board. So I'm likely to hear you before you hear me. Then, once we can hear each other, then comes the best bit, which is actually talking to the students and answering the questions. Once I've answered all the questions, we use the remaining time to say goodbye to each other and end the connection. I'll then spend a few minutes configuring the radio back into a rebroadcast mode and then I'll go back to my day job, which is, of course, doing science on board the International Space Station. ARIS is a brilliant opportunity for astronauts to talk to school pupils. It's really rewarding to hear how excited the students are when they're talking to somebody up here in space. And it's a true privilege to be able to inspire our next generation of scientists and engineers through amateur radio. Thanks again for that video, and back to you, Bob. Over. Thank you, Carol. Now that we've seen what a contact looks like from both the ground side perspective and what it looks like on board the ISS, now it's going to come the most exciting part for all of us involved, your contact with astronaut Steve Bowen on the ISS. Steve's call sign is KI5BKD. Uh, today on the ISS, we'll be using the amateur radio call sign NA1FS, which is the call sign used for uh, all U.S. space calls. The amateur radio ground station today that we've uh, introduced previously also uh, is K6DV in Greenbelt, Maryland. We're located uh, at Camp Goddard. Melissa 4, KM4CZN, will be the lead operator of the K6DV station today. Melissa, please. 
tell us a little bit about K60UE and how you will handle today's contact with the IFS. Go ahead, Melissa. Thank you. We're pleased to be here today to help you with your ISS contact. Amateur radio station K6CUE is located on the top floor of a building at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. We are just north of Washington, D.C. Today's station volunteer operators are myself, Melissa, ham 4 cbn and Ken McCoy, N3F2X, right here beside me. On the roof is a directional antenna high above the ground that we will be pointed be pointing at the ISS as it passes directly over our location. The antenna is connected to a radio, but is also connected to the phone line we're using to talk to all of you. We use a computer running satellite tracking software to tell us where the ISS is. It steers the antenna to maintain a good signal for the duration of the path and controls the radio to compensate for Doppler shift. The operator here at K6CUE will control our radio's transmit receive mode, that is myself, while the astronaut controls the ISS radio. Only one station can talk at a time while the other listens. This is why it is very important to clearly say over so that we know when to switch the radio back to receive mode so you can hear the astronaut's reply to your question. Just before the pass is to start and we get ready to call the ISS, we will open the radio squelch. You will hear some static and it sounds like this. We'll hear the static until the ISS answers our call. Once we have established contact, we will turn it over to the first student to ask those questions. We wish you great success. We are now uh, three minutes, four seconds to AOS. Back to you. Over. Okay. Thanks for that introduction, Reminders here about a little under three minutes before the planned acquisition of signal from ISS. Time for the ISS era contact quickly approaching. We want to remind everyone in the uh, area, please use your cell phone and please be as quiet as possible when you're not the one asking astronaut Steve Bowen questions. Remember what we're doing uh, with ARIS is an experiment, so we can never tell the results, positive and negative, until the experiment is over. As it's said many different times, space can be hard. Students, please don't forget to stay over at the end of your question. Uh, let's just take a minute here, uh, a few seconds. Uh, thank some people that have made the air side of the program uh, possible. As Carol mentioned, it takes months to get through applications and uh, get to the point where we are today. There's some very dedicated people on the Earth side in scheduling and making arrangements who have helped make all this possible. And we very much appreciate their effort as well. The ISS will soon come into radio range at k 6 uh, And so I'm going to hand it over to Melissa. we got about one minute and 30 seconds, and we will make an attempt to call as early as possible. So everybody there at Montrose gets as, as much time as possible to ask questions. Let's uh, take it away. All right, so we are looking at about one minute till AOS. Um, I am prepared to call the International Space Station. Their call sign is NA1SS. As you hear, as you heard, astronaut Tim Peak refer to um, using the phonetic alphabet and A1 Sierra Sierra. If we don't, we don't have a clear connection initially. I will hold uh, till I hear the astronaut Steve Bowen clearly as he moves to a little higher altitude. So be patient. I will be clear about sending it. NA1SS, NA1SS, this is K6DUE. NA1SS, NA1SS, this is K6DUE. NA1SS, NA1SS, this is K6DUE, over. NA1SS. NA1SS, 
This is K6BUE. Over. Kilo 6, Delta Uniform Echo. This is November Alpha 1 of the space station. We're good to go. Over. Great. I hear you loud and clear. Copy you. Cool. It is time for your question. Over. And here we are at Montrose Middle and our first student question. I'm Lillian in the seventh grade. Have you ever thought you couldn't make it and almost gave up trying? What encouraged you to keep going? Over. Uh, there are many times, uh, for many different reasons, I've thought about giving up on different things. But uh, I've always tried to challenge myself and meet those challenges and, and keep moving on. You know, if you never challenge yourself and you never fail, uh, you're never going to learn and grow and explore. I'm Emily in the seventh grade. As a member of the International Space Station, I assume you work for NASA. Could you tell us your path of working for NASA? Over. Yeah, for me, the path was uh, through the United States Navy. I went to the U.S. Naval Academy. I joined the submarine force, and uh, I applied to be an astronaut in 2000. Uh, and that's how I was selected to be an astronaut and join NASA uh, 23 years ago. It was uh, through the military. But there are many ways we have... Uh, any number of uh, of uh, people. We have psychologists, doctors, I mean, and uh, physicists, and pilots, and all sorts of people out there uh, who are now astronauts. Over. I'm William in eighth grade. How do you cope with the mental and emotional challenges of long-term space travel? Over. Uh, they help us a lot with the, the mental and emotional challenges of long-term space travel. We have great communications with our family as much as possible. Uh, we basically call home every single day. We try to do video conferences at least once a week with our families. Uh, plus, there's also entertainment, and uh, a big part of it is to manage your schedule so you have a little bit of a break, uh, but not too much of a break because it's good to keep active and busy, and we have really interesting work up here. Over. I'm Jordan in the eighth grade. What is the training process for becoming an astronaut? Over. Well, once you're accepted to be an astronaut, it takes about two years to complete the initial training, uh, and then you become an astronaut, and uh, you are ready to be assigned to a flight, but you continuously train for years and years and years. And I actually find that one of the most enjoyable parts of being an astronaut is the continuing training. Uh, over. I'm Tarius in the eighth grade. Why do you want to be an astronaut? Over. Over. When I was a small child, I watched men walk on the moon for the first time, and I followed uh, space, the space program ever since. I've always found it amazing. Uh, incredible engineering, incredible science. It's uh, done a lot for society, and it continues to do a lot for the world, and I want to be a part of it. Over. I'm Jan Bell in the sixth grade. How do you sleep since there is no gravity? Over. Uh, actually, in space, I sleep really well. Floating is uh, very comfortable, and it's easy to sleep. You usually have to tie yourself down, uh, but not everybody finds it as easy as me. I just happen to enjoy it. Over. I am Levi in the eighth grade. How do you eat? Over. Uh, no, yeah, we eat uh, as everybody normally does, except our food is uh, usually uh, dehydrated, needs to be rehydrated or it's uh, thermostabilized, or uh, we have very little fresh stuff, very little cooking. Actually, no cooking. We just reheat and eat. Over. I'm Yuri in the sixth grade. How do you take a shower in space? Over. Uh, Yuri, yeah, we do not take showers in space. Uh, there's no shower on board the space station. And uh, so basically, it's all uh, essentially sponge baths. Over. I am Javen in the sixth grade. How do you brush your teeth? Over. And Javen, we brush our teeth the, the normal way. Uh, what you do with the uh, toothpaste in the end is either you swallow it or you spit it out into a towel. Over. I'm Kaden in the sixth grade. What happens if you get sick in space? Over. Uh, fortunately, on every crew, we have a uh, crew medical officer, somebody who's trained. Uh, to handle any emergency situation. Uh, fortunately, right now, we actually have a doctor on board, uh, which is not uncommon in the astronaut corps to have a doctor available. Uh, so they will take care of it. 
And uh, if need be, we can always go home. Over. I'm Michaela in the sixth grade. What does it feel like coming back into Earth's atmosphere? Over. It's uh, pretty amazing to come back into the Earth's atmosphere. All that energy you see with a launch, uh, with all the flame and uh, speed, that all, all that energy has to come back out as you're entering the Earth's atmosphere. And so as you enter, you heat the uh, surface of the vehicle a couple thousand degrees, and it glows, and you develop a plasma, and it's actually uh, pretty amazing. Uh, right on the way in, I'm looking forward to my landing in just about four months. Over. I'm Brandon in the sixth grade. What type of stuff do you do in space? Over. Hey, Brandon, the reason we go to space is to research and explore and make life better on Earth. So we are, uh, have just left uh, a couple hundred hours of uh, science experiments on the latest vehicle. We're continuously doing science on board space station, and uh, that's what we do. We do research on board. Over. It's William again. How old were you when you first realized that you wanted to be an astronaut? Over. I was probably five, Lily, when I first wanted to be an astronaut, but then I put it out of my head and I really didn't think too hard about it until the opportunity came up to apply in my mid-30s. Over. It's Emily again. How long does it take to become an astronaut? Over. Uh, Emily, from the time you are accepted to the time you're certified as an astronaut, it's usually about two years. Uh, after that, you continuously train until you are selected for a crew, and uh, you're always training and always uh, doing your best uh, to improve. Over. It's William again. How long will you be on the International Space Station, and can you return later? Over. Uh, for this mission, we'll be on board the International Space Station for about six months. Uh, one of our crewmates, Frank Rubio, who came up on a Soyuz last year, uh, he'll be on board for almost a year. And uh, yes, you can come back after a long duration mission and come back out and do another long duration mission. Over. It's Jordan again. What are the hardships of becoming an astronaut? Over. And Jordan, I will call the uh, hard work and uh, uh, training. Hardships are actually enjoyable. The hardest thing is uh, the time away from the family, which is uh, something I really treasure over. It's it's Teresa again. How have you gone to the back of the moon? Over. Uh, nope. Actually, I have spent all of my time in low Earth orbit. Uh, we haven't been back to the moon since 1972, but the next, uh, hopefully at the end of next year, we'll set a, moon, a mission beyond the moon further than we've ever gone before. It's going to circle the moon and come back to Earth as Artemis. We just named that crew a couple weeks ago. Over. It's John Dell again. How long did it take to get used to no gravity, especially when sleeping? Over. And you know, you, uh, you adapt fairly quickly, but it takes about six weeks until so living in gravity feels pretty normal. And I'm just past that point now, and I've never had a problem sleeping in uh, microgravity. Over. It's Levi again. How do you get back to Earth? Over. And Levi, you get back to Earth uh, by essentially disconnecting from the space station in your capsule, uh, doing a burn that slows the vehicle down, and you enter the Earth's atmosphere, and that drag will bring you down and safely down to the Earth uh, as long as the parachutes and everything else works. Over. It's Yuri again. What is the bathroom like? Over. And Yuri, you can probably look that up online. It's probably the easiest way to explain it. It can be pretty complicated. Uh, but it's, uh, it's one of the more interesting aspects of living up here. Over. <laughs> it's Javen again. Are you able to see other planets as you orbit the Earth? Over. And Javen, the uh, problem we have on board the International Space Station is none of our uh, windows look into space. They all look toward the Earth, and in reality, we're only a couple hundred miles close to the planets and the stars. We just don't happen to have the obscuration of the atmosphere uh, and clouds in the way, so they'd be a little bit brighter, but they wouldn't be any bigger. Over. It's Canada again. Does the International Space Station have a heater? Over. And Canada, we don't have a heater as such. Uh, we can control the temperature. Uh, by adjusting the cooling, essentially, for the International Space Station on board. And uh, each of the modules have heaters to keep the 
structure uh, integrity in, in place. Over. 30 seconds till AOS. It's Michaela again. Is it hot when you're coming back into Earth's atmosphere? Over. Hey, Michaela, yes. As I explained, all that energy you put in going through space, you have to take back out, and it uh, basically comes across the surface of your capsule as you come in or in uh, my earlier flights on the space shuttle. And the, uh, the air outside you will actually glow orange as you enter into the atmosphere, and uh, it's a pretty amazing ride. Over. We just wanted to say thank you, Mr. Bowen. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. From Montrose, Virginia. Thank you very much. Over. Oh, congratulations to everybody there at my uh, middle school. We've just shared a wild moment of history. Amateur Radio Ground Station K6DUE here located in Greenbelt, Maryland, and operated by Melissa Ford, Dan Ford CPN, and Ken McBoy, and 3 X. We succeeded in contacting astronaut Steve Bowen, AI5DKB, aboard the ISS directly. And he spoke with uh, the students at the Montrose Middle School in Montrose, Virginia. Now for the International Volunteer Team of ERA, including the Amateur Radio Satellite Corporations around the world, the American Radio Relay League, Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, Japanese Space Agency, Oscosmos, the Russian Space Agency, NASA, this is Bob McCown, a member of three India, Yankee, India, your ERA's moderator for today. Sending my salutation to all of you in amateur radio terms, we say 73, which means best wishes. That ends the ERAS portion of the program. Carol, back to you. And thank you all very much. We appreciate all your help. Thank you and uh, for all your hard work and keeping us informed and all the tests and everything. I'd like to thank everybody here. Dr. Perry, the Seeger, everybody at John Cross Middle School, all of you all, you all deserve a round of applause. What a job. Don't be playing my part. I hope this has been a momentous day for you, and it's certainly been one for me. Thank you all very much, and I'll end it the way they did and say 73s, which is best wishes in ham radio talk. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.